The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining uh, myself, um, Shona Bradshaw, and representatives from our, our partner, Trapex, for today's webinar, which is intended to provide an introduction to deception-based technology. I'm delighted to be joined today by Nick Palmer, who's one of the technical consultants at our partner, Trapex, and also Asif, um, as well, who's going to be doing some of the, um, his colleague is going to be doing uh, an introduction to what Trapex do as well. Um, so just to give you a very brief overview of what we're going to present today, um, the objective of this webinar is to give our customers an insight into how they can use deception-based technology as a different way, an alternative way, of responding to modern malware and attacks. Um, we, I'll give a very brief Bright's intro, a lot of you do know us, so I will promise to keep it brief. Um, talk about um, a little bit around what we need to learn from recent attacks and then hand over to Asif and Nick who will take you through the majority of the, the presentation and demonstration today, um, which will be you know, the meat on the bones of how you can actually respond to some of the attack patterns we're seeing at the moment. At the end, we'll have a live question and answer session as well. And so lines are on mute throughout the webinar for attendees, but please do pop any questions you have into the chat box and the questions box, and we will pose them all to Nick and Asif at the end. A little bit of housekeeping for you for today's session. Uh, so lines are on mute throughout, um, but as I said, questions are welcome. Please do post these via questions in chat um, so we can have a really interactive Q&A at the end. Um, we, today, we will look at strategic and technical discussions only, so we won't be talking um, commercials on any technologies um, that you see or any of the solutions that you see. Obviously, further discussions are welcome with your account managers um, after the call if there's anything that sparks your interest. Um, we do have a survey at the end. Please do take time to fill it in. It's very short. It just enables us to make sure that these webinars continue to hit the mark in terms of providing you with appropriate and relevant content. Uh, lastly, um, a recording will be made available for all delegates for the session, um, and also the, the presentation slides themselves will be made available um, so that you can share those internally within your teams. So a very little bit about Bytes. Um, so we've been going since 1999 um, as an independent reseller, um, focusing solely on security. It's really important for us. Um, we were purchased by Bytes in 2011, and since then we've continued to focus only on security and, and specifically network security. Um, as part of that, we're really passionate about security education. It's why we run regular webinars and technical updates for our customers. Um, and it's really a core part of what we do is, is look at helping businesses future-proof their infrastructure. We are fortunate enough to work with some really fantastic best-of-breed technologies across the globe, um, such as Trapex that are presenting today, um, Checkpoint, um, Forcepoint, RSA, F5, to name a few. And we hold top partner statuses um, with those technologies. What that means from a customer perspective is that you know that when you work with um, a particular technology with Bytes, that you are you are going to be benefiting from strong technical support, um, strong consultancy, and a lot of advice and interaction and expertise from Bytes. So that's enough about us. Um, very briefly, why is a different approach needed to malware? So, firstly, more breaches. There has been you know six major data headlines just in the last month in the UK. Uh, you know. Very different companies are hitting the headlines constantly for breaches, and the the variety and the methodology of those attacks is differing and and getting more complex. So there's a, there's an increasing cyber threat landscape. At the same time, malware is getting more complex and more difficult to detect. A lot of the time, when malware is hitting um, companies' networks, it's actually relatively benign, looks like benign code, it sleeps for a while, and then it's not until it starts trying to move uh, laterally, laterally and spread infection within the organization that it's picked up. Um, companies are also working with multiple different point solutions, many of which don't have automated connections. So it can be quite simple for malware to move within the organization and spread its, its tentacles without being um, necessarily picked up because systems aren't talking together, etc. And lastly, as a, as a security community, um, we're just much busier than we were 
but you know five six years ago uh, there's increasing data people are managing data in the cloud people are managing very different solutions as well as just the sheer volume of data and logs etc that are being generated so again it's it's difficult to detect um, when malware is spreading within the organization and what's happening um, with all the will in the world um, you know Verizon data breaches report last year so it's around about 200 days is the average time to detect um, you know an, a breach within your organization so as a security partner of businesses we we're always looking at different ways of enabling security teams to close that gap and turn that detection rate into days and, and make sure that they're locking down things quicker as they hit the network um, so basically, just to summarise, you know, humans can only do so much. Um, a new approach is needing to, needed to avoid giving hackers time to play undisturbed. And you know, when that malware moves and starts doing penetrating the network and doing damage, um, then we want to lock it down. And, and that's why we've chosen to introduce you to Trapex today. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Nick and Asif. Um, they're going to take you through a sort of 30 to 40 minute introduction to deception-based technology. And also a demonstration show how it actually works and um, to um, to give you some ideas of how it might be applied in the organization and then i'll be back on in 30 minutes or so to run the question and answer session um, thank you very much for your time i'll just pass over to nick now thanks very much indeed shona uh asa for you with me yeah, I am, yeah. Great, over to you. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for your time uh, today. We'll just do a quick introduction into, I'll just do literally one slide about who Trapex are, the people behind Trapex, and a very high level in terms of what we do, and then I'll hand it over to Nick to, to walk you through the architecture of, of our solution. So who are Trapex? Trapex are a leader in deception-based cybersecurity. The term deception itself was categorized by Gartner. They named as a core vendor last year, and they've been very vocal about the adoption of deception-based cybersecurity. We've been established for a number of years now, founded initially in Tel Aviv, Israel. We're now a global company headquartered in the US, uh, San Francisco in the US. Our founders uh, were in our ex-IDF being responsible for cyber defense for one of them you could say one of the most attacked and hacked countries in the world and they bring a wealth of experience and expertise. Our go-to-market is 100% by our partners and channels and we're doing this today with uh, with Byte who is a strategic partner for us. Our most notable investor is Intel Capital who are a key board member and key strategic go-to-market partner as well and Nick will probably cover off uh, some of the integration if you guys use uh, McAfee and the integration that we have there. So what do we do? In a nutshell, we are using the concept of deception, which is an evolution of the honeypot to help detect lateral movement within organizations from the persistent attackers, whether that be internal or external. And dramatically, the key thing is dramatically reducing the time it takes to detect that uh, that lateral movement or attackers within your environment. So, like Shona mentioned, some from the Verizon report, the average these days, depending on which report you read, is about 200 days, and it's really what traffic's are bringing to the table is it's getting that down to near real time within minutes, and we're, we're really changing the dynamics and the, the cost, pushing that back to the attacker, so they're spending less time on your real assets, and we deploy uh, camouflage traps that intermingle within your uh, within your network and creating a shadow IT network within, within your environment and we issue what we call high fidelity alerts with conviction so it's an opposite to a sim where you may be getting depending on the size of organization thousands to millions of logs per day but once we've deployed our malware traps you'll be, get high fidelity alerts so there should be nobody interacting with those malware or malware traps and that will go right to the top of the stack to say look okay yeah, there is potential attacker lateral movement that uh, Trapex have detected. So Deception Grid is our platform, Nick will go into that, the architecture, and discuss you know, deploying how we deploy series of mesh malware traps that are designed to be indistinguishable from your real IT assets. So we'll build from the ground up, we've built emulations, and again Nick will go into more details about this, which are common commodity components 
across the infrastructure, so Windows, OS, Linux, databases, databases, and even SCADA environments. So we've really operationalized this and an evolution of the honeypot. Nick, do you want to go into the next slide? Yes, of course. Thanks, Asif. So good morning, everybody. Nick Palmer here. I'm a technical consultant with TrapEx. And really, just to reinforce a lot of what Asif just said, um, really, TrapEx come to the fore when perimeter defenses fail. In other words, when the traditional uh, systems and controls um, effectively break down. The endpoint systems haven't de uh, detected the malware or the human attackers, and there's effectively been a breach. Then really, TrapEx step in to assist in, in detecting uh, human attackers on the network as well as, as, as commodity malware and zero-day malware, but also assist in deceiving these, these threat actors to make sure that they're giving away as much of their techniques, tactics, and procedures, TTPs to use a military term, uh, but also to, to, uh, to, to hopefully betray their motives. So by understanding and describing the sorts of interactions that these attackers are having with our malware traps, we can start to identify, for example, whether they're going after databases, user credentials, intellectual property. So effectively, once these, uh, these guys are beyond the perimeter, then we're, we're into the situation where we defend and mitigate the impact of these, uh, of these attackers. So the deception grid is the TrapEx solution that assists with this, and it's notionally a three-tier architecture. The TrapEx Secure Operations Console on the left-hand side is effectively the ingress point into the trap infrastructure. This is where you add and configure traps. This is where you set up uh, for the traps to have interactive services, to have a compelling data with which the, uh, the attacker can interact. Uh, you uh, uh, manage and maintain the traps, upgrade them, but there's also a very flexible web-delivered forensic interface that will allow you to view the output metrics from the traps, uh, view what sorts of uh, activities that they're discovering, and view what the attackers are, are doing when they interact with the traps. So the TSOC effectively uh, is a very, very thin, uh, lightweight, thin provisioned uh, piece of infrastructure, typically requiring 16 gig of RAM and 400 gig of hard disk. So this is not a machine that you're going to use to take over the world. As, as Asif mentioned, it's commodity hardware. It doesn't need to be rocket-grade specifications, um, and it will uh, provide TSOC functionality to, to the users. In the middle, we've got the TrapEx appliance. Again, this doesn't need to be a rocket spec, typically 8 gig of RAM and 100 gig of disk space. And this is really the core IP of the TrapEx solution. This is where malware traps are, are configured and deployed, and also where our botnet detector resides, which we'll come on to in a little bit more detail later. But effectively, it's within the TrapEx appliance that you start to deploy emulations and decoys onto the infrastructure. You can support up to 64 VLANs with a single appliance, and you can have uh, an unlimited number of, of decoys on each VLAN, typically 100 plus. So it's a single appliance, as I mentioned, an 8 gig, 100 gig disk space machine will support up to 1,000 emulations. These are very, very lightweight, very, very skinny, but still very, very convincing in that they form interactive services with which the attacker can actually exchange information, and, and which will convince the attacker that he's interacting with real IT, uh, IT real estate. But as Asif mentioned, this is a shadow network of fake assets. And we'll come on to that in a bit more detail in a second. Then finally, the sandbox. Now, the sandbox is, um, is effectively what happens when, when we detect malware on the, on the infrastructure, when a, an attacker attempts to upload malware to one of our traps. Uh, the portable executable file is siphoned off to the sandbox. Now, TrapEx are not a sandbox manufacturer. We, we have an OEM arrangement with, with several of the, the sandbox manufacturers. Typically, we have our own sandbox in the cloud that customers can leverage, or if you have a pre-existing uh, sandbox on site, you know, McAfee ATD, any of those kinds of things, open source solutions like Cuckoo, then we can integrate with those, or we can supply a sandbox for you to have on-premise. So typically, um, the TSOC and the TrapEx appliance are on-premise solutions at the sandbox is often provided in the cloud, but all can be provisioned on-premise if necessary. So moving on to a TrapEx implementation in the wild, if you like. Effectively, uh, the TSOC, the Sandbox, and the TrapEx appliance are connected via a dedicated management VLAN. This is also protected with, with its own traps, so we can identify nefarious activity on, on the VLAN there if necessary. But if you like, the core of the, of the TrapEx solution is where we, we span or tap the egress traffic going out to the internet uh, from the corporate network to identify commodity and zero-day malware, uh, things communicating with command and control servers or, or problematic domains that have been identified elsewhere. We've got our own threat database, and we inter interact and integrate with other threat databases to identify that traffic. 
Similarly, the TrapX appliance will plumb into the core switch into the trunk infrastructure so that then we can start to deploy our malware traps. So effectively, you'll see the items in green here are, are the malware traps. And <clears throat> as Asif mentioned in the introduction, we can deploy Windows clients, uh, so uh, XP, Windows 8, Windows 10, Windows Server, all, all of the flavors with v various well-documented vulnerabilities associated with them. We also deploy Linux, uh, MySQL, uh, we can provide uh, interfaces into fake network equipment, we can provide interfaces into SCADA systems, Modbus and those kinds of things, as well as VoIP um, an array of different uh, other things. So for example, web, um, web service, we can pr provide a, a web server that looks very, very much like a, a, a personalized intranet page with which an attacker can, can interact, or even uh, provide uh, in, intranet pages that look like their industrial control systems, for example, air conditioning systems on board ships. So there are a huge number of different applications for these traps. But effectively, once these things are deployed, they then form a uh, Uh, that can provide a point of interaction with the attacker. So let's take email references him by name, maybe references the names of his children, uh, his personal his personal details, tastes, hobbies, preferences, recent purchases, uh, any of those kinds of things. So compelling, and some of the, re the, the, the recent examples of spear phishing emails that I've seen are mighty compelling. Uh, that he clicks on the link and downloads malware to his machine. Now that the attacker has a foothold on the infrastructure, the attacker will need to know where he's landed and he will need to, to start, start doing some footprinting to identify effectively what's on the infrastructure on which he's landed and what's the fastest route towards monetizable IT assets, be they names and passwords, be they IP or anything else that he may be interested in. And in order to do that, the attacker will start uh, looking out to adjacent devices on the network segment that he's, he's landed on and will arrive on a, 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 a TrapX trap. And as Asif said, that's when we, we have a high degree of conviction that we've, we've generated a real alert. You guys on, on the phone will be used to looking at SIM solutions, security information event management solutions that generate tens of thousands of events per day. Uh, and that the, the, the real act, the real work is sifting through those to find out what's relevant. You know, this is, this is the typical security big data problem. With TrapX, it's a small data solution because nothing should be talking to these devices. These are shadow assets. Users don't know they're there. Uh, asset scanners and update scanners can be configured so that these devices are whitelisted and they're not touched. So on a good day, nothing will touch a TrapX trap. Except in this instance when, for example, a, a, an attacker has reached out, identified a trap, and maybe uh, by interacting with it, he's identified, for example, as an open file share on that machine, or he's SSH'd into it, and he's copied an executable file across that will self-detonate and will further infect other real estate on the network. Now, the thing to point out here is that there is nothing within uh, the traffic simulations that can actually be executed. These are there, There's no un underlying operating system. There's no underlying virtualization. These are purely emulations, projections, if you like, of real IT assets. So there's nothing on this particular trap that can actually be compromised. So when the attacker has uploaded the malware, the TrapX trap then knows to siphon that malware off via the TSOC into the sandbox. And there the analysis happens. Now within the sandbox, we do three different levels of analysis. The first is static analysis, where we uh, decompile the file, identify what DLLs it's calling, identify what, which obvious um, methods and TTPs it may be using to infect the, uh, the target systems. We then do reputational analysis, so we take three hashes from the file, the MD5, um, but also the fuzzy SSD hash as well, so we can determine genealogy of the malware and uh, compare it with known uh, existing malware, for example, via VirusTotal and our own threat database. And in doing that, we can get a view as to whether this malware is pre-existing, how serious it is, and what it's likely to, to want to do to machines that it, uh, that it infects, giving you detailed indicators of compromise um, file that you can then give to your incident responders or to your SOC team to, to do further analysis. And the final piece is a dynamic analysis. So the sandbox will detonate the malware and will identify what it's trying to do. And in, in doing that, it will, for example, block initial requests out to the internet so that it can compile a list of IP addresses that, uh, that the, the malware is trying to talk to. 
Once it's done that, once it's got the list of IP addresses that the malware is trying to talk to, it will then start to allow the malware to talk out to the internet to see if it's going to download further customized content or to see which information it, the, uh, the malware is trying to exfiltrate from the network to a remote com command and control server or to a real attacker on the, uh, on the internet. So effectively, what we've done is we've taken uh, an incident where a spear phishing attack uh, has re resulted in malware on the target machine. The attacker has moved laterally and um, attempted to put uh, an executable file, a self-detonating executable file, onto a file share to further infect what he believes to be uh, a vulnerable machine. By taking that malware and putting it into the sandbox and performing the three levels of analysis on it, we've not only identified the, se the severity and the likely consequence of that malware propagating, We've also effectively taken a good deal of the, of the cost of the attack and put it back onto the attacker. For example, uh, producing malware and customizing malware is an expensive business. And running a, a large uh, th threat team, for example, APT1, it's believed that this is a multi-departmental, multi-person multi uh, organization. Some people are responsible for social engineering. Some people are responsible for generating uh, malware content and so um, by, by disrupting that activity by encouraging these guys to betray not only their motives but also any specific zero day or customized malware we've ev effectively for want of a better word emasculated that malware and taken a good degree of the, of the IP associated with it and, uh, and, and rendered it useless. So the next step is with the botnet detector the TrapX appliance is able to identify outbound traffic talking to the internet, talking to known bad IP addresses on known bad domains. Now what this means is that if there are compromised machines elsewhere on the network, whether they've touched a trap or not, the fact that they're talking out uh, over the internet to known bad servers means that we can identify compromised machines on the network. If you have a large desktop fleet, it may well be that half or three quarters of a percent of your desktop state may well be compromised with commodity malware at any particular point in time. And so the act of identifying and remedi remediating that could be a considerable benefit from a cost saving perspective. So the botnet detector is updated regularly. If we learn any lessons in the sandbox from the malware, then we can then update uh, the botnet detector with new IP addresses and domains to which these devices are talking to make sure that uh, we can identify any other compromised machines on the network, whether they've interacted with the trap or not. Uh, I'm going to take an absence of, of questions as, as a good sign thus far, so uh, please do use the, the comment box if you have any questions or feel free to, uh, to, to use the Q&A section at the end. So moving forward, just one of our key integrations uh, which is worth mentioning here is our, our connection into the McAfee Threat Intelligence Exchange. So using the, D, the DXL communications layer, uh, lessons that we learn within the TrapX Deception Grid infrastructure, for example, from malware on the network, can be used to automatically propagate through the McAfee infrastructure and inoculate machines uh, on, on, the, uh, on the infrastructure, on an Intel managed infrastructure, according to lessons that we've learned from either zero day or new malware that's, uh, that's been identified on the infrastructure as a result of one of these attacks. And we can get you more information on this if this is, if this is required later. So what I'd like to do is run through a quick demonstration scenario. I've got a number of different uh, potential attack scenarios that I'd like to show you today. Um, the, the first is uh, we, we've got a, a network here. I've got a bunch of virtual machines that I've configured that have got the TrapX Secure Operations Console in residence, and they've got a number of TrapX appliances. The TrapX appliances that I've got are a, a Windows machine with an open file share and with some other, other vulnerabilities. I've also got uh, a piece of network equipment that I'm going to try and uh, connect into. I've got a, a MySQL uh, device. I've, I've, uh, I've done a network scan. And I've identified a, a device talking out on, on, I believe, port 3308. So I think that that's a MySQL database. So I'm going to see if I can connect to that. And I've also got an SSH connection into a vulnerable Linux box. So for the purpose of the, the, the primary uh, demonstration that I'm going to show here, though, is um, with integration into an ArcSight security information event management system, although you guys may have Q1, you may have Logarithm, um, we can, or, or Splunk, we can connect into those via JDBC or ODBC. Uh, we're going to show a couple of compromised machines on a local network that have been attacked via the Dark Comet Remote Access Trojan from an attacker on the internet. So there's been a successful spear phishing attack for two of these execs, and they've ended up with malware on the machine that can be remotely controlled via this dark comet trojan. 
So we're going to take a piece of malware, we're going to drop it onto one of these uh, one of these traps, uh, which is then going to be automatically executed and and then siphoned off for analysis and um, and ultimately reporting. So in the first instance, um, and I'm going to ask As if if you can see my sheet, my screen, okay. Or show it. Can you guys mute there? Yeah. yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> Two okay. points. Yeah, it's all it's all making fine net. <laughs> no problem. So what we have here is is the uh, the dark comet remote access trojan. So effectively, we're going to take a look at the anatomy of attack of an attack here. For those of you that have not seen uh, a remote access trojan before, this is effectively the uh, the interface. We've got a couple of uh, compromised machines here, you can see screen previews, you can see details of the machines themselves, their name, uh, enumerations and articulations of the operating systems that are being run and the um, available resources. Now, using this, uh, this, this menu here, for example, I've got this thing called fun functions where uh, within the fun manager I can hide things on their desktop and I can hide the taskbar and I can have oh so much fun with this poor end user that doesn't know that their machine's been compromised. I can either even present message boxes to them with various severities. Um, but maybe most importantly as a hacker, what I can do is I can do a, a scan of the network and I've identified a whole bunch of interesting devices here, particularly data center three here, um, which is a device to which I'm going to try and connect on the network share. So if I take another one of my, of my machines here, I'm going to use the system functions facility to get a connection into this box and I'm going to do a, a net use on this machine, which will probably already be in place. So there we go, device already in use. So this has already been mapped. So I've got a, a remote share actually onto that, that compromised machine now. Now what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to connect into this share. So that it's effectively I've mapped an X drive on my compromised machine into what I think is the C drive on this data center three device because it looks like it's got an open share. So what I'm going to then do is I'm going to go into my files manager view here. And I can see here my X drive. This is on, on my remote machine. And I can drill in here. And what you'll see is that this looks an awful lot like a regular a regular file system on a Windows machine. You can see we've got the program, uh, the program files, which we can drill into. We've got the user files, which we can drill into. We've got even individual files articulated in here. So to, to an attacker, this looks very much like a, a system on a, a compromised machine. The, the thing is, is that this is occupying precisely 48K on our, on our emulation. This is a very, very lightweight emulation of a file structure. It doesn't really exist. It's just there to be interacted with and for the user to think that he's got a point of purchase on our, our infrastructure. So my user is, is then going to go into the user's folder on the local machine into the attack tools folder and I'm going to copy across a piece of self-extracting, self-detonating malware to that remote machine. And we can see straight away it's updated and as far as my attacker is now concerned, he thinks he's compromised that machine. That, uh, that will self-extract and self-detonate on that machine and uh, it will be a very, very bad day for that organization according to the attacker. What I'm also going to do while I'm at it, because I'm just going to leave that, um, that, that attack where it is for now, uh, I'm also going to use some of the additional IP addresses and the information I've gleaned from these other additional IP addresses to maybe try some other, other attacks. So, for example, I've seen a device listening on port uh, 3308, so I'm pretty sure that that's a MySQL database. So if I issue a command into this MySQL database on the problematic IP address, Then as an attacker, I'm very, very happy. I've all of a sudden, I've got a connect connection into this, this MySQL database. And it's looking like it's going to allow me to uh, connect in and start issuing commands. So I do a show databases. And I've identified there's a couple of databases on this, on this machine. If I do a use data, I've effectively got a very, very convincing command back that will allow me then to show the tables on this particular machine. And I've seen that there are some tables in the, in the database that potentially have got some very, very valuable information in. Now, the thing is, is that this is purely an emulation. This doesn't exist anywhere, save for on our Trapex appliance 
convincing this attacker that he's actually got a point of presence into the uh, into the infrastructure. So if I, I exit out of this, now I'm also interested in another piece of infrastructure, uh, so I'm going to use my compromised uh, session here to see if I can get into dot one two nine, which looks an awful lot like a piece of network equipment. So again, as an attacker, I'm very, very happy. It's looking like it's connecting me into a piece of, in of infrastructure. And it just needs a password. Now, um, I'm not very imaginative as an attacker, so I'm just going to try a default password here. And again, it's looking like it's let me in. It looks looking like I've got access to, uh, to, to a command line into a switch. And so, fairly convincingly, as a, as a, an, again, as an emulation that's designed to confuse and confound an attacker, if I do a show here. It's even given me the available commands. So let's say, for example, I want to show the running config here. It'll actually give me an emulation of a running config on this switch, including specific information about uh, masks, about IP address conventions, and all those kinds of things. And you'll see that, I mean, effectively, by interacting with these things in different ways, the attacker can can significantly reveal reveal a lot about what he's what he's trying to identify. Let's have a look about uh, show processes here. Again, it's given me a, an, an enumeration of the um, of the uh, of the processes that are running on this switch, even though the switch isn't really real and it's just an emulation. And I guess the final thing I can show is let's show IP routes. I'm going to deliberately make a a, um, a a syntax error here. Show IP routes. It's even given me a, a prompt that says that I've I've got the command wrong. So let's do show IP root. And it's given me a, a, the, the correct response. So hopefully that's a fairly clear indication that um, we've got a couple of very, very convincing emulations here. So what we've done is we've copied a file across to a compromised, a compromised, compromised machine. Um, we've telneted into a into a switch. We've got a connection into a SQL database. There's just one more that I like to do. Again, I'm going to use my trusty putty here to telnet to SSH into another machine that. I'm interested in. Again, by doing my network scan, I've identified that this is potentially a Linux machine that I can I can interact with. So I'm going to log in as root. Now I'm uh, I'm not sure what the password is for this. I'm I'm fairly sure, based on my experience elsewhere in this infrastructure, that these guys are pretty lax about password uh, policies and things. So maybe I'll try admin. That one's failed. Maybe I'll try Tor with a couple of zeros. That one's failed. So maybe I'll try Tor with a couple of O's. And I'm in. And again, I've got a uh, an error here. Server refused to allocate priority. It's a it's an, an error that's associated with uh, with Linux systems. And um, it's just put there just to to create the illusion of this being a real Linux system. So if I go back to my file system here, I can enumerate the file system, I can change to a particular file, and I can interact with the devices on that, uh, with, the, with the files on that file. So again, this doesn't exist anywhere. This is purely an emulation. It's, a, it's designed to confuse and obfuscate the attacker, to ask him to reveal his techniques, tactics, and procedures. So we've got effectively four individual attacks there. We've got copying a piece of malware to a file share. We've got accessing a MySQL database and enumerating the tables. We've got uh, SSH into a Linux box. And we've got to get getting access to a piece of vulnerable network equipment. So let's have a look at the interface of the product, and we'll, we'll show exactly what, um, what we, can we can glean from those, those inter interactions. So in the first instance, and again, I'm going to rely on Shona and or Asif to, uh, to give me details if uh, you guys can't see anything, but I'm presuming you can. You're all clear. So, perfect, excellent. So, what we've got here, this is the main dashboard. This is our, our key kind of ingress point into the TrapX infrastructure. And what you can see very, very clearly is um, this is in MSSP mode, although this could e equally be a conglomerate which has a, a, lot, a, a number of, of uh, child companies, or it could just be a um, uh, an individual company with, with these being uh, departmental. Articulation. So this, this, if we were running in, in in organizational mode, this word would say department, department, and you would have a view of the traps on each of your departments. So we, 
an idea of the malware detected. We've got a threat store. We've got the geolocation both of the threats and of the traps. And we've got a view as to the types of things that are going on, botnet, command and control, malware, trojan, intelligence gathering, and a list of the, the source and destination IP addresses that we're interested in. But what I'd like to do in the first instance is just go after my um, my event that where I, I dropped some malware onto the file share just to show what happens. So we would normally get an alert for this. I'm just going to sift this down by interactions, and I'm going to do a search. And we can see over SMB that I've got my create file here. Now, effectively, what this means is that you can see the command and, uh, and control the kill chain effectively of this attacker connecting to a, to a machine, performing a logon. So you can see the credentials that the, the user has logged on with. You could see that they are articulating um, out to, to, to particular shares. You can see that there, as a file has been created, connected to an administrative, administrative file, another file has been created, and then there's been a disconnect. So effectively, we've got a complete view of exactly what this attacker did on, in interacting with that, that open file share over SMB. We can also then drill into the, uh, the malware here and start to get a view as to the severity of the malware and exactly what it's trying to do when it runs on the infrastructure. Uh, we can also generate these views as, as, as PDF reports. So you'll see here, for example, that we've identified that this is a, this is a backdoor Trojan. Um, we can see that the sample is malicious based on the static analysis on its own. that has got a severity level of five. We can see an articulation as to the, uh, the fact that it's a, a Trojan that downloads unwanted content and can arrive as, as part of a spear phishing email campaign. But we've also got severity of the processes, for example, and again, the level of severity given for individual processes within the machine and a threat score that talks about the malware's persistence, how stealthy it is, exactly what it's trying to do, whether it's trying to exploit shell code uh, and what it's doing on the network, whether it's doing um, uh, data exfiltration or key logging. And again, just a break here, so to create a new, a new PE file, ran a newly created exe file, attempted to download active content, and again, ran an exe file by Windows Shell. So you'll see the, the malware that's been, been dropped onto that trap is, is pretty nasty, but because it was executed in a sandbox, it doesn't matter. We've got a complete view of, of the, the target IPs that it's speaking to, what it's trying what it's trying to do when it's been downloaded and installed, and, uh, and, and effectively what we can expect if we see other machines. This is effectively a, an indicators of compromise my report that we can then give to our, our responders or to our SOC team to do further analysis. Now if I go back to my uh, my view here, I'm just going to close this up and we'll take a view as to the the event and analyzer for some of the other things that I've done. So for example here you'll see we've got our My, MySQL interaction and again you can see fairly, fairly clearly that in establishing a connection with this device and logging on using my credentials, you can see that I issued a show databases command, I showed the tables, and then I disconnected. And again, we've got this very, very clear kill, train, kill chain articulated with, with timestamps and everything else that shows very, very clearly exactly what was going on during that particular attack. And all of this would be raising very high fidelity alerts, because just to, to say the point again, nothing should be talking to these devices. These are purely emulations, they're just there to, to confuse and obfuscate are the actions of, of, of hackers. So if this dot one on one machine is talking to this, much less starting to issue well formed commands in into the uh, the supposed piece of infrastructure that's designed to yield monetizable information, then we've got we've got a very, very bad a bad day at the office. Similarly, you'll see my connection here with my Cisco device. Now from that perspective we can see that we've got a connection established here. And we can see that uh, there was a, there was a, disc, a disconnect. Now, bear with me a second. What uh, what I've got here is I've also got the facility to drill in here and to get a PCAP of that um, that particular piece of malware or that particular interaction. Bear with me. But also, if I go in, for example, to my SSH view here, then you can see my my uh, attacker IP, my .7.1 machine, 
attempted to connect with uh, a number of different passwords, and you'll see it's captured every single failed password that I uh, that I tried to log in with. So I tried admin, I tried root with zeros, I tried tor with zeros, and then I tried tor with o's. And it's it's opened me a shell very very nicely, and then shown me on top of that effectively the shell and the commands that I've then been trying to run on this particular device. So you see me issue the ls minus uh, cell, the CD, um, to articulate the um, to articulate the the file structure to change into the bin folder again to articulate the folder and to exit. So what I've done with my, my four attacks is I've got a huge amount of information not only about how sophisticated this attacker is in terms of the malware that he's trying to put down, but I've also seen that he's after data, after, after data on my database, he's got into a MySQL box and has uh, enumerated the tables on a box and tried to access the data. He's got into the network equipment and trying to do, to do a, a show routes and show a config on that particular device. So he's clearly after more information about my internal networking. And clearly he's trying to get into, the, into this particular Linux box just to explore and just to see what he can find. So again, to reiterate, all of these are just samples, these are purely four, four very, very quick samples of the kinds of attack that you might see when you've got a, an attacker on your network trying to move laterally. And as long as he touches a TrapX trap, uh, then typically what will happen is he will then interact with it, and as soon as there is an interaction, as soon as there is uh, an attempt to scan that device, to, uh, to spot which uh, operating system is running on that device or which patch level it has to identify vulnerabilities, then you get an alert straight away showing the, the target IP and exactly what that attacker is trying to do to that device. Similarly, with commodity malware, again with the botnet detector, we can then identify, for example, uh, outbound conversations to the internet using uh, known bad domains and known bad IP addresses such that if there are machines elsewhere on the network that are compromised, whether they've touched a trap or not, they can very, very easily be, be identified. And typically then, once a machine has been identified as being infected either via a human attacker or via malware, then there are a number of things that can happen. Uh, the machine can either be uh, completely taken off the network and you launch an incident response to, uh, to identify how the, the attack happened and how the machine was breached, or uh, depending on the, on the risk appetite of the organization, maybe you would want to siphon the attacker off to a, a protected part of the network where he's interacting only with traps. You know, so using something like a network access control uh, integration, we can take uh, this, uh, uh, this information uh, take the, the, the information about the hack, take the fact that the machine has been compromised, and then move that attacker to a, a less privileged part of the network where they can be encouraged to reveal more of their te techniques, tactics, and procedures. And in doing that, we can learn more about uh, what they're trying to do, whether they're a uh, nation state, whether they're organized crime, or whether they're just a very, very lucky, very, very adventurous uh, hobbyist who's, uh, who's managed to find a vulnerability through some commodity spear phishing attack that's, that's been successful and has yielded a foothold onto the machine of somebody on your network. Just as a final point from an integration perspective, as I mentioned, one of the key things with TrapX is that we, we endeavor to leverage investment in the wider security ecosystem. So for example, we inter, inter, integrate with uh, sandbox technologies. So if there is a pre-existing sandbox, we can use that. But what you can also see here is the, sandbox, uh, the ArcSight Security Information Event Management SIM console that shows in this particular instance um, for example, bad logins from, uh, from uh, TrapX uh, devices. So effectively what you can do is you can configure an entire dashboard within your SIM solution to receive alerts from TrapX. So effectively and quite pragmatically, I think the TrapX have identified that probably the core single pane of glass for most security oper operatives would be the, the SIM solution. And so effectively, my piping high fidelity, high severity alerts into the SIM solution from TrapX, we can then start to to assist uh, with the alert fatigue that a lot of SIM operatives have, and that is once they receive an alert from TrapX, they will come to, to trust it because, as we've, as we've said and as we're fond of saying over and over, nothing should be talking to a TrapX trap. These are devices just designed to confuse attackers, and so if something is talked to it, then it's either a misconfiguration or a, um, an, insider, uh, an insider threat or a, a piece of malware, and in any instance, uh, troubleshooting from a, from a high a high fidelity alert like a TrapX alert is significantly easier and gives significantly faster results from a productivity perspective. 
So I was asked to leave five or ten minutes for questions at the end. I hope that this has been of interest. As I say, just to recap, um, a quick overview of the architecture, three-tier architecture, and then a view into uh, how an attacker might, using remote access Trojan, upload compromised executable content onto what he believes is a real machine, but which is a trap, showing the trap, then siphoning that off to the internet for analysis and reporting. But then our attacker, thinking he's got extra specially lucky because the network scan he performed appears to have identified networking equipment, uh, SQL databases, and uh, Linux boxes that he can interact with. So an SSH into the Linux box with failed password attempts, um, a connection into the MySQL database showing exactly what he's trying to do with the, the database tables, and a connection into a piece of network equipment to identify uh, how, he's, how he's attempting to gather more information about the, the, uh, the topology and the infrastructure and the IP address convention within the, the organization. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for their attention. I'm the guest to hand back over to Shona to, to cover questions. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, just checking, can you hear me all right? Can everyone hear? Yes, indeed. Perfect. So we have a myriad of questions for you. You might need um, sort of more than five minutes, so closer to ten minutes to cover this. Um, so I'll fire through them, um, if that's all right. So I have a question regarding deployment design um, from one of the gentlemen in the audience. How would deployment design allow for covering traffic passing within or across DMZs? So, uh, so typically, um, you, you you would you would put a, a trap into, or you could have a trap in into the DMZ, or you could you could um, monitor or mirror the, uh, the, the the connections into the DMZ to a to a port and put a trap there. Um, if you put these things out on you know on, on, um, onto the onto the, I mean I've done this myself. I've put, connected a trap onto the onto the onto the internet, and it's normally absolutely beset with with activity, um, probes and all sorts of things. So, um, so typically, yes, you would uh, you would you would either mirror a connection out to the DMZ or have a device in the DMZ to uh, to do that if you so wanted. Okay, thank you. Um, so then, a, a question close to, to to our hearts as well as some of our customers. And um, so we have uh, a lot of our, our customers who work with Checkpoint Solutions. How well does Trapex integrate with Checkpoint Solutions? Um, what sort of what's your current levels of integration with the Checkpoint? Um, so, so, so depending on on what uh, what level of integration is is, is required. So, um, for example, we could we can send uh, send alerts out to, to those solutions. We can um, so, so in fact, actually, now that I, now that I think about it, I've, I've, um, I believe that there is a document that we've got that describes in a lot more detail our, our integrations there. Can, can, we, can we get the name of the person that asked that question and, uh, and follow up with an email? Yes, certainly. That's not a problem. In fact, because that's, that's going to be relevant to quite a few people on the call, um, I can make that available um, to the wider audience as part of the, the follow-up email with the recording. So we can cover that in detail then. Uh, so I have another question um, for you regarding I'm sorry, a couple of questions in one. How much data is transferred to your servers from the appliance? So uh, from from the perspective of the, the data, the data from our service to the appliance. So the, the conversation. So let's say, for example, we have an attacker uh, actually on on the trap. Uh, then. What we're talking about literally is just reflecting the activities that that, that uh, user is doing on on the trap. So it's typically, it's a few packets per per interaction, unless the attacker uploads mal uh, malware, in which case the, the size of the malware. But typically, that wouldn't be particularly large because obviously, you know, huge files being uploaded to to a machine would, would start to ring ring alarm bells. So it's as we say, it's, we're fond of saying it's a small data solution, and that includes conversations between the tiers as well as the number of alerts that it generates. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a question about vulnerability scanners. Um, how does Trapix work with vulnerability scanners such as Qualys, for example? Um, that's what the kind of mean. How does it work? Yeah. By this, um, do the shadow devices appear when being scanned when Qualys is scanning? Think that's what. So, the so typically, I mean, so, so typically, um, so so typically, you would add, you would add the the shadow IT devices to a white uh, like a whitelist so that they weren't scanned. We recommend that you scan them anyway because it's it's interesting to see how the vulnerabilities show up to things like Qualys and and, uh, and those kinds of things. But uh, typically, as with anything like that, asset scanners um, or uh, update update devices or anything like that, up, update servers, we would recommend adding those things to a to a, a whitelist. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so then I have a question around um, the malware and signatures. So what happens if virus total or the traffic database hasn't seen the malware or its signatures before? So that's really where the three levels of analysis come into play. So the first, the static analysis is, is identifying you know, what, we, what we can from decompiling the malware. The reputational analysis is the part where if, if it's pre-existing, we can, we can raise it. But the dynamic analysis is really what's useful for, for kind of zero day or, or malware that, that doesn't exist either in virus total or our own uh, threat database in that the, 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 the malware is then detonated in the sandbox and we can identify what it's doing. Then I guess the question is, if you've identified something zero day, whether you would want to update uh, any any um, any of our databases or anything like like Virus Total, given that as soon as the the attackers know that their malware has been characterised and typed, they're going to change it. So typically, if you if we do identify something zero day, then we would recommend keeping that quiet at least until the remediation work had been done and, and we'd exhausted all investigative possibilities as to the source of that malware. Okay, thank you. Uh, so a couple of, of, of devil's advocate questions um, coming up. Um, mm -hmm. So firstly, um, running a config on a switch isn't possible without entering an enable password. Um, don't you think it seems a little suspicious and would give away what the Trapix device actually is? It it's, 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 an ex, it's an excellent question, and I, I love devil's advocate questions. Um, the thing is, is that this is a... Um, this is an emulation designed to intercept interactions. So as, as soon as someone has touched that device, has attempted to log in and has attempted to, to do anything, whether syntactically ac accurate or not, we've got a conviction. We've, we've identified the source IP address from which that attacker has, has, has come. And then, obviously, we can then perform remedial action on, on either the target machine or see how far he's, he will go before then um, actually giving up and exiting. So okay. it's a great it's a great question. And the answer is is that the, the, these these things don't don't need to be absolute real world representations. They just need to be convincing enough to to encourage the attacker to interact. And once he's interacted, we have the conviction. Okay. Um. So a, a question on a similar vein. Um. What's what are the fail safes or what's the chance that the attacker recognises the deception servers as fake? So uh, and I guess it's it's similar to the previous question. Um. The, and the idea is is that uh, the, uh, these things are, are designed to be as, as convinced, convincing as possible. With the level of, of, of convincingness, if I can use that word, um, there's, there's a trade-off between both the footprint of the, the appliance and the number of emulations it can run. So we call these things medium interaction. Medium interaction are designed to, to be pretty convincing. However, um, if the attacker, again, in a, in a similar vein, the fact that the attacker has... Um, has interacted with it at all means that you know we've we've, we've identified that there's someone on the network. So I, I, th I think um, we ha we've also had pen testers. So I mean there was a there was a penetration test that went on recently when we were on site, and um, the network team gave the pen tester a bunch of IP addresses to investigate, and they apparently interacted with the trap quite happily for several hours before uh, before exiting and, and didn't actually realise it was a trap, a decoy. Fantastic. Um, so then another question regarding analysis of malware. How long does it take to analyze the malware? And does the attack breakdown show the exact commands the attackers used? So it, it, depending on the sandbox that's being used, it should do yes. And typically with the, the report is generated within two to seven minutes. Okay, fabulous. Um, so next question. I'm going to take three or four more questions, and then and then well, any other questions I will get back to people individually on. Um, can you elaborate on an interaction with the sim, such as logarithm? Um, how does how does that work? Yes, indeed. So so I mean, effectively, any so we've we've got a, uh, both a syslog and JDBC connection that we can pump out the logarithm. Than where any of the events that are generated within Trapex can be uh, can be put out to that sim and uh, normalized and have the common events extracted as as would any other log source. So effectively, as as the as the sim really being the kind of the prime the prime point of interaction for SOC and many NOC operatives these days, um, we don't seek seek to replace that workflow. We would then just have Trapex as a, a source of event and alert information into that uh, into that uh, that pain of glass. Okay. 
Um, so then we've got a question around, um, again, around malware analysis. What use is the attack analysis if the results are from a compromised ghost machine um, that has vulnerabilities that the rest of the network PCs don't have? So, so within this, so, okay, so the, um, I'm just I'm framing framing that question in my own mind because the, the executing the malware it effectively happens in the sandbox, so so that will eff effectively be a much more uh, accurate representation of the production machines. The, effectively, the vulnerable machine, the thing with the vulnerabilities, is rendered vulnerable in order for it to have malware put onto it, and then what happens to the malware afterwards is is it's, it's effectively siphoned off and put elsewhere into the sandbox for, for execution. So. Um, so in that particular instance, the, the fact that the malware is, is, is run in an environment where it's allowed to do exactly what it wants means that we can pull out a report of all of the likely consequences of that malware ex executing on a, a machine in the infrastructure. I hope that answered the question. Okay. If, if not, um, to the gentleman that asked that question, um, feel free to drop a note out to your account manager and we can cover it off in more detail individually. Um, so I have a last question um, around here. Um, about what do you use to persuade the attacker to move laterally to the traffic shadow networks? Is there anything? It's a, it's a great question. It's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I think the, the person who's, uh, who's asked that question has identified that um, in a lot of instances, um, when a, an attacker gains a point of purchase on the network, they don't actually move laterally. They will sit quietly and they will uh, they will gather information and intel and, and perform reconnaissance just on the machine on which they're their resident. What we have, we have these things called deception tokens, which can represent uh, dummy hosts files. They can represent uh, fake putty sessions, browser credentials, um, fake web pages, all those sorts of things that point to the traps. So, for example, if an attacker has has gained a point of presence on a particular machine and is looking at the local hosts file, we can make it such that the host file that he's looking at is 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 a dummy one that has got a bunch of IP addresses which are in fact traps with very, very compelling names that would encourage him to interact with them. So uh, to use a fishing analogy, I don't know if, if the person who asked, asked that question is, is a, a fisherman, but if you put a, a, an empty hook, in, uh, like a, a bare hook in the water, you're not going to catch anything. If you put a baited hook in the water, you'll, you, you'll likely catch a fish. But if you throw a, a great big lump of, of ground bait in the water around the hook, which is designed to create a great big, a great big cloud of very, very interesting and um, potentially food-containing material for fish, then they'll gravitate to it. And effectively what we call chumming the water is, is putting these deception tokens around the network and, and creating a, a breadcrumb trail effectively back to the traps that the attacker is likely to follow. But it's a very, very good question. Okay, Fab, and um, that appears to have answered the gentleman's question because he's just said thanks. So uh, I will um, use, use that opportunity to, to wrap up as we're just after 11 o'clock. Thank you very much to our audience for, for the myriad of questions. Uh, you know, really um, glad that you, you, you find the, the topic interesting and then it's uh, sparked a few questions and points of thought um, for Back at Base. Um, it just remains for me to thank Nick and thank Asif very much for their time this morning. Um, just to remind you that we have got a little survey at the end, so please do take the time to fill it in um, so we understand um, how the session has worked for you. Um, and lastly, um, you'll be sent the recording of the webinar by the end of the week um, alongside any relevant documentation. Um, if, you, if there's any other information that you require after you've got the recording, then please just do reply to me via email and I'll make sure that your account manager is in touch to provide that. Um, thanks everyone for their time and have a lovely morning.